We have a good number of people joined now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, COVID-19 in Idlib. Um, new forecasting showing the WHO response severely underplays risks to life, hosted by the Syria Campaign and Idlib Health Directorate. My name is Rebecca Falcon, and I'm the campaign manager at the Syria Campaign. We're here today to discuss a new report by the Idlib Health Directorate with four fantastic speakers, a mix of individuals both on the ground and public health experts. They've contributed to a report entitled The COVID-19 Forecast in Northwest Syria, the Imperative of Global Action to Avoid Catastrophe. So let me introduce our speakers. Joining us from the field are Dr. Munzer Al-Khalil, the head of Idlib Health Directorate, and Dr. Mahmoud Hariri, who is the director of the Health Information Systems Unit in Northwest Syria. We also have two esteemed public health professionals with us. Hazem Rahawi, who is the Senior Programs Manager of the American Re Relief Coalition for Syria, and Dr. Aula Abara, who is an Infectious Disease Research Fellow and Co-Chair of the Syria Public Health Network. Please note that this event will be held on the record. I'd like to ask all attendees to submit questions through the event using the Q&A function and not the chat or the raised hand function. And thank you all so much for joining us today. Before I open it up to the panel, let me set the stage. The COVID-19 response in Syria has been addressed largely based on geography in each of the areas, the regime controlled areas, the Northeast and the Northwest. Each of these areas are being handled differently by the World Health Organization, as well as by local actors. The latest figures show there are 44 confirmed cases and three deaths in regime controlled areas. And there is one confirmed case of a person who died in Northeast Syria with two more infections. Of the more than 200 tests that have been performed in Northwest Syria, all have been negative so far. We know that the health system in Syria has been systematically targeted by the Syrian regime and the Russian government over the last nine years. Only about half of the health facilities in Northwest Syria are functional, and 67% of Syria's total healthcare workforce has been displaced outside of Syria. More than 932 healthcare workers have been killed during the conflict. In their report, the speakers lay out the status of the medical sector on the ground. They're here to help decision makers know where the gaps are and where the World Health Organization and other health actors um, response falls short of what's needed in order to ensure that Syria is equipped to handle its coronavirus response. So without further ado, let me turn over to our esteemed panelists to say more. I'll begin with Dr. Mahmoud Hariri. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you very much for your introduction. Could you please put the slides? Yes, one minute. If you begin speaking, I'll get them up in one second. Okay. Okay, thank you. So, uh, in terms of uh, health system in Syria, as you see here in these slides, you can see the situation, the current situation for the available available hospitals in Syria. Uh, you see here on these slides, this is the total number of uh, hospitals available, which is in northwest Syria, either in Idlib or in Aleppo, uh, including these hospitals. It's supported by health authority. So we have only 60 hospitals available. Uh, this is, doesn't mean that we have enough beds. If you look, focus on the bed, you will see there is different, different issues. The term hospital it doesn't mean that we have uh, plenty of beds. In inward beds, we have only 200, 2,189 ward beds, which is distributed, as you can see here, between Idlib and Aleppo. Uh, Aleppo means Northwest and West Aleppo. Uh, if we go to the ICU beds, you will see we have only 240 ICU beds, including the beds in uh, Turkish supported hospitals. So, but in total, in all of these uh, ICU beds, we have only 98 adult ventilator. If we look to our data, we have a data collecting data from January 2019 to the end of 2019, the bed occupation ratio for ICU beds is 98%. That means there is no single bed available vacant for any patient during an average in a year. Uh, we have 64 pediatric ventilation, which is normally not used 
in COVID-19 as far as most of the patients are adult. So next please. We, we studied three scenarios uh, in Syria. The first scenario, we put some parameters. My colleague will talk about these parameters in, in, in the methodology issue. But if you look on the number of the available bits, the previous uh, slides, please, it's for the bit. Uh, no, the next one, the next. There is some problem in the order. Next one, please. Uh, uh, for the word bit, uh, next, please. Please draw the slides we have, sorry. Okay, no problem. So uh, on, the, on the report, you can see uh, these figures. The, we consider that we had a thousand and a hundred beds will be dedicated for COVID-19, which is not the reality, even though we will see on that slide, which is not now presented here, that by the beginning of the seventh week in the best scenario, the health system will be overwhelmed. In the second scenario, the health system will be overwhelmed by the week six. And for the third scenario, which is just talking about camp population scenario, the health system will be overwhelmed by the work for the, the weeks four. Here in this slide, we consider that we have dedicated 120 bits, ICU bits will be dedicated for COVID-19 which is up till now, we don't have even single bit for, uh, from those number. But even if we have 120 bits in these three scenarios, you will see that the health system will be overwhelmed in the first scenario by the beginning of the sixth week, in the second scenario by the beginning of the fifth week, and in the third scenario in the mid, by the mid of the third, fourth week. So the situation in general, as you see here, that the health system will not be able to tolerate more than six weeks, five weeks, and four weeks in these three scenarios, even after fully supported by 120 ICU bits and 1,100 uh, world bit. And this is the, the, the common situation. So uh, I will leave the, 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 the panel for my friend to talk about methodology used in this study. Thank you so much. Um, we're now going to hand over to Hazem Rahawi, who is the Senior Programs Manager at the American Relief Coalition for Syria. Please. Hey, hello everyone and thank you Rebecca. Um, this is Hazem Rahawi and I'm glad to join you today in this webinar. So I'm going to talk now about the methodology behind this report. So in this report we relied on the WHO COVID-19 essential supplies forecasting tool that the World Health Organization has put in public for preparedness of COVID-19 pandemic in countries all over the world. Then we inputted the data that was provided by our colleagues in the Health Information System Unit on population and health facilities capacity and utilization in Northwest Syria. We decided to look at three scenarios that could evolve in Northwest Syria based on these parameters. First of all, regarding the clinical attack rate. So the attack rate is defined as the proportion of population at risk that gets symptomatic after exposure to the novel coronavirus 19 during the period of the epidemic. We decided to use an estimation of 20%, that 20% of population will be infected and become symptomatic during this epidemic. This number is totally hypothetical and uh, is only used for the purpose of forecasting. We decided to use this number looking at previous pandemics, including the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, in which the clinical rate was estimated to be 20% in the first year. And in general, the influenza attack rate has a range between 3% to 11%. Uh, also doubling rate. So this is the number of days that which cases are expected to double. And since uh, also this number is different between countries that are affected by the current COVID-19 pandemic, we decided to assume three scenarios. The first one with a doubling rate of four days, so the number of cases will double in four days. The second, a doubling rate of 3.2 days. And the fourth third uh, scenario, a doubling rate of 2.3 days in the populations of IDP camps. So it's, uh, it's applicable to one nearly 1 1.2 million people. Um, for the uh, estimation method that is being used in this tool, um, it uses an exponential growth equation to estimate the cumulative number of cases on any week of the epidemic. 
for case fatality rates, we decided to go and use the global average of 5.9% based on the available data that we had while writing this report until April 11th. Of course, the global average CFR seems to be increasing, but we decided to use this lower number for the purposes of our calculations. Um, the number of severe cases and critical cases. So prior reports that has been included that including the Chinese uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has suggested some uh, has suggested that 14% of COVID-19 will be severe and 5% will be critical. So we use these numbers to estimate the number of severe and critical cases. All other parameters in this tool has been predefined, so we left them as they are uh, designed by WHO. So for defining the critical time point, which Dr. Mahmoud has mentioned in the capacity, health capacity, we decided to estimate that the health system capacity reaches critical time points when number of severe and critical cases requiring hospitalization reaches 50% of the number of all available ward and ICU beds. So since the health system in Northwest Syria has 2,148 bed, ward beds and 240 ICUs, 50% would be nearly 1,100 ward beds and 120 ICUs. This has been the methodology for this report. And it must be noted that this report is not an EPI model, but rather an application of an available forecasting tool. So uh, this is just the first step for all of us. And all previous assumptions that I've mentioned are hypothetical and for the purposes of this report. Um, thank you. I mean, this is all from my side. Thank you so much. Um, I'd now like to introduce Dr. Aula Obara, who is an Infectious Diseases Research Fellow and the co-chair of the Syria Public Health Network. And I'd encourage people to also write their questions in the Q&A section, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, thank you very much. And um, firstly, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Hazim and Dr. Munzir and Dr. Mahmoud for all the work that has gone into this forecasting. Um, I think the first proviso to make is this is an estimation um, for preparedness purposes based on the information that we have at this point. So why does Northwest Syria matter? Why are we having this conversation? Well, this is a part of the world where the population density is higher than almost anywhere else in the world. There's 4.17 million civilians uh, in Northwest Syria and Idlib and Northwest um, and Northern Aleppo. Um, with some of the areas where IDPs, so internally displaced populations, having a density of 40,000 per square kilometre. So put, to put that in comparison, uh, among the Rohingya refugee camps, it's about 40,000 40, per square kilometre. In London, where I'm speaking to you from, um, our density is about 4,500 per square kilometre. So you can imagine the density of the population um, is much greater, and of course that's going to cause a vulnerability in terms of um, attack rates and spread of COVID-19, should there be any cases. The other important thing in terms of the local population is this is an area that has been devastated by years of war. So the very latest escalation between December 2019 uh, and March 2020 has displaced more than 948,000 civilians. Um, overall, of the 4.17 million uh, people in Northwest Syria, 67% of them are IDPs. And why does this matter? Well, many of these IDPs are living in uh, refugee camps, tented settlements with host communities, um, unfinished buildings, um, because many of their homes and villages have, in the last few months, been razed to the ground. And that doesn't just include their homes, it also includes health facilities as we have seen, uh, but also important infrastructures like electricity, water. So WASH, which is water sanitation and hygiene, is one of the most fundamental um, things that we can do to prevent transmission. In July 2019, last year, um, in, though, in that month alone, there were eight attacks um, on water facilities in Idlib governorate. The water facilities and electricity uh, facility, uh, facilities, which of course are necessary for the water pumping stations across Syria, have been used as a weapon of war. And so this is important for the fact that measures that we are implementing in the UK and in other settings, uh, particularly relating to isolation, social distancing, quarantining, washing hands frequently, disinfection, are almost meaningless when you have a population of such a high density. 
Um, and you can imagine for the community groups going into the refugee camp and into the IDP camps, uh, working with local populations, trying to explain the importance of hand washing, trying not to share utilities, for example, shielding older people who may be or vulnerable people with communicable, uh, non communicable diseases. Um, or who are immunosuppressed for any other reason in these settings um, is nigh impossible and almost laughable when we're trying to explain um, to a family who might be living 12 to a small room or to a tent uh, that this is what they need to do to prevent transmission. Um, and so when we discuss the clinical attack rate, um, of course, uh, Dr. Hazard has used a methodology where we are providing an estimate based on the information that we have now. I think our concern and anyone who knows that part of Syria well uh, will be that the attack rate could be greater because there's very little uh, in the way of measures that we can mitigate the spread of this infection. Um, and of course, there are insufficient numbers of health facilities for populations to go to. So there won't be enough ambulances, for example, to transfer patients who are suspected cases or who are clinically unwell um, with COVID-19 to the nearest appropriate facility. And of course, there's other vulnerability factors um, among the population. Um, I always, we always focus on the risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, um, perhaps smoking-related obesity that we know to be risk factors in COVID-19 from other studies. Um, it's also important to remember that psychologically, across the whole of Syria, but particularly in northwest Syria, people are devastated. And what that means is when you're trying to explain the importance of social distancing, lockdowns, um, not being able to go to work to prevent transmission, um, it has a severe psychosocial impact on the population. You might be met with resistance that you might not be, for example, in the UK or elsewhere, uh, where we have a better standard of living. Um, I'm going to end by saying that the reason we're having this discussion about Northwest Syria is that this is a part of the world that has seen devastating uh, conflict uh, with an underfunded, fragmented response uh, with insufficient resources to meet the needs of the population. Um, and what we do need to think about is a cohesive, coordinated public health response uh, to meet these needs, as well as to upskill the local healthcare workers that are remaining uh, and also the local health facilities. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to um, Dr. Munzer, who's going to explain more about uh, the preparedness in northwest Syria. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, I want to explain a little bit about the general situation uh, in northwest Syria. Uh, about 1.2 million people internally displaced from southern Idlib, Hama, and Aleppo to the Syrian-Turkish border just in the last year, 21% of whom lived in regular camps, while 79% resided in different places, including schools, governmental buildings, and open areas. The occupancy rate of some camps in northern Idlib is 400%, with a large shortage of shelter, food, and potable water. There is a significant weakness in the health sectors as a result of the regular attack campaign that has targeted medical, medical facilities over the past year, with about 70 medical facilities targeted since April 2019 so far. Also, we are facing a continuous security threat and inability to reach the southern areas of Idlib as a result of the constant pumping, and it will be very difficult for the health sector to deal with a major threat is caused by the corona pandemic, and at the same time, the threat is caused by continuous bombardment on the southern areas of Idlib. Finally, a weak and late response by donors and the WHO. So more than two months after the work of the task force had been started, we were not able to provide one additional ventilators for the Northwest Syria as example. Our proposal from our point of view to the UN agencies for a comprehensive response to corona is to support the following points. One, a comprehensive ceasefire in the area. This will allow 300,000 people to return to the southern area that are still being pumped almost daily. And this will mitigate the severe 
overcrowding in the camps. In addition, this will allow returning family to recultivate their lands and thus secure a decent living. Two, the immediate realize of detainees and abductees and without preconditions. The three, extending the mechanism of cross-border aid flows under UN Resolution 2165. The non-extension of this resolution and the transferring UN aids to Damascus means literally besieging more than 4 million people within Northwest Syria where 67% of its population are IDDs and forcibly displaced people. Consequently, mortality and morbidity rates would rise to reach unbelievable limits, especially that date of voting on the resolution will be accompanied by a widespread of coronavirus according to the predictive studies and consequently the need for the cross-border its flows would be most acute. For securing the need fund for the PRP plan approved by the Gaza Intelligence Cluster as soon as possible, because further delay would make us miss the opportunity for good cooperation before the pandemic spreads, knowing that the health sector will, be, will not be able to withstand more than three weeks uh, uh, as Dr. Hariri mentioned in his speech, within the extending capacity after the emergency of the first case. Therefore, it is important not to relay on the facility and devices currently present within the region, as well as regularity programs in responding to the corona pandemics, because this will save some lives and causes the deaths of others because they need the same equipment and facilities. By the same token, in Idlib province, there are only 47 ventilators, as Dr. Harry mentioned. Five, activate the mechanism of true coordination between partners in Gaza and Tal cluster, because we need plans meet with the real needs on the ground and consider the views of the members of the health cluster. Six, effective communication through OSHA with all parties in the Northwest Syria, including the de facto authorities, to take all necessary measures to limit the arrival and the spread of the coronavirus within the area. A follow-up committee of the staff of the organizations and the health directorate should be formed to obtain the real assessment of the actions taken and follow up the activities. Seven, securing the need fund for other plans related to different clusters to reach an integrated plan. Finally, development of a cross-sectorial coordination mechanism. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Munza and all the speakers. Um, that was so interesting. Um, we're now going to turn to the question and answer section of the of, of the webinar and just to say that there's a brilliant 167 people listening right now so that's great um, there's a Q&A function available through zoom so if you've got a question you'd like to ask please do put it in there you can also vote up other people's questions if you if you're keen to hear an answer to what's already been asked um, and we can make sure that we prioritize those um, other points, just to say that the study will be circulated after the webinar. I'll be sending an email out with that link for everybody. Um, it's online now. And I also wanted to mention that our previous chair, Germana Kadur, sent her apologies for not being here. She had a family emergency, so she, she can attend. Um, so turning to our first question for the panellists, um, and maybe uh, Hazem or Dr. Mahmoud, you could answer this one. Can you explain a little bit more about how your forecasting differs from the World Health Organization's forecasting at the moment? Um, and a bit more about the uh, attack rate that you've estimated and how this compares to the corona spread elsewhere in the world or other, other illnesses that the audience might be familiar with, like their common flu's attack rate. Um, but yeah, how does, how does your forecasting differ to what the World Health Organization is currently estimating? Well, I think maybe Hazim can give more, but I give some numbers. Uh, uh, what the estimation of, uh, which is presented in uh, last cluster meeting in WHO, they estimate that according to Wuhan, I don't know how they consider that Wuhan would be our uh, similar situation for like our situation. 
they consider that uh, in total uh, we will have confirmed cases 2,400, almost something like that. And at the end, when we discuss with them that this is uh, not unreliable and this is uh, this is not a real estimation, they said, okay, yes, this is not a real estimation and you can take it away and throw it away, which is not uh, useful and uh, need to work about. But I think maybe Hazen gave us more about this in terms of uh, doubling rates. Yeah, um, thank you for the question. I mean, now everything, as we can see, there are lots of models. And this is this reports, as I, I repeatedly say, that this is not an EPI model, so it doesn't have the EPI model. What we have been looking at is a more forecasting uh, tool that WHO has provided uh, publicly. I mean, it's on the public. For our estimations, when we looked at the numbers, um, we looked at similar numbers and we tried to use as many uh, scientific background as possible. So um, for, uh, for attack rates here in this context and this epidemic, it's still unknown. And of course, it's widely debatable on how to use it. But to be able to estimate the total number of the population that could be infected, we estimated like it's a more of uh, agreement between all of us as uh, experts be based on scientific background, and it can be checked online, that a 20% across all age groups and population can be considered a very viable uh, consideration. Um, not mentioning, I mean, WHO um, has been using another one, which is fine. I mean, as much as we are trying to start a debate and more of a discussion about these numbers in total. For the doubling rates, we have used also the widely known numbers we have now, um, and also what is available in the forecast tool. So the forecast tool has um, different categories for a doubling rate that you can use. I mean, the forecasting tool is in general it's good in estimating things. So we were looking at a medium rate of four days, 3.2 days, and 2.3 days for like medium, fast, very fast. So we tried our best, um, like I say, in, in our uh, uh, parameters as much as possible using the same tool. So this is just the first tool that we are looking at the numbers as quickly as possible to support the work of the task force and other entities. I hope I have answered the question. Yes, that's great. Would any of the other panelists like to come in on that point? Okay, we'll move on to the next question. And this one's from the BBC from Debbie Randall. Are you confident in the accuracy of the test results in Northwest Syria so far? So are you confident that there aren't cases of coronavirus at the moment? Uh, do you mean in Northwest Syria? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, they are the following standard. Uh, they trained already in uh, Ankara uh, and they are doing standard and everything are transparent and we, we are sure that all of these tests is up till now is negative. Uh, there is total 335, I think, if I'm not sure, this is yesterday or today number and all of these tested suspected patient, oh, they are negative. Thank you. Okay, so the next question. Um, do you think that there has been a bias in the World Health Organization's approach in responding to coronavirus in areas that are under the Syrian regime controlled areas and in Northwest Syria? Um, have they neglected opposition areas since it is not the state according to the World Health Organization? Um, and I might point this one to Dr. Munzer. Yeah, actually we think that uh, there are a lot of differences between the response of WHO in Damascus and uh, in Northwest Syria. Uh, uh, first of all, there, there was like a huge difference in, in planning. The first planning in Gaziantep was three months, while the first planning in Damascus was six months. And uh, the applied on, of the planning on the ground started in, in Damascus uh, and the resources was available for for, for a long time before we started anything in Northwest Syria. So uh, actually, uh, till now, after two months uh, uh, from our working uh, in, in task force, actually really, we, we till now, we don't have uh, 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 ventilators ready to receive corona patients. We don't have, we don't have a, a, a comprehensive, actually, response. So we don't have, for example, referral system. We don't have uh, a clear uh, uh, Material system. We don't have hospital, so I think there are there, there is a huge problem actually in response in uh, uh, in northwest Syria. 
uh, and uh, as uh, Dr. Mahmoud mentioned about the test till now, the number of uh, tests, it's just about 5,000. So I think we will face a huge problem uh, in the next few days if uh, the WHO don't uh, provide us with more uh, uh, with more tests and till now we wait just to, to uh, receive more ventilators but actually we, we didn't receive any more ventilators till now so I think yes there are there is a, a big difference uh, uh, in response that we control between the different area in Syria. Well, I would like to add a little bit uh, after Dr. Munzer just to clarify for the testing issues uh, we have only single machine in Idlib city which is able to test around 10, 100 tests per day, and these uh, lab have around 5,000 test capacity only. They have only 5,000 kit, not kit, a test for single 5,000 patient. And now we used 335. That means remaining, you can calculate it. This is the only available ability to uh, do a test over all Northwest Syria for 4 million people. And we have a promise, we had some promise from the WHO that there is two other CBR machine will be uh, procured, but up till now, nothing. Thank you. Um, so we have another question. What are the recommendations that you would conclude from your research? And let's start with Hazem. Uh, about this, I mean, from our side, we definitely, I mean, at least from the scientific and the paperwork and uh, definitely in terms of preparation on the ground, I will refer to Dr. Mahmoud and Dr. Munzer. But from my side, um, more studies and more discussion. I mean, um, WHO has been always a partner with us in Northwest of Syria and they've been excellent people. We work with them for a longer time. We hope that this report will initiate a discussion about um, preparedness and more of a scientific driven preparedness that we can help in all of this. Um, uh, this is just the first step. It's not uh, the ultimate thing. We definitely need more studies on all of this. This is a type of setting that is um, that is very tough in these terms. Um, we are lucky till now that we don't have any numbers, at least, of coronavirus. Or at least we don't see the effect of higher cases of uh, severe acute illnesses that are transferred to ICUs, um, at least, and the tests are very minimal. So this report, I mean, from my side, uh, the recommendation from my side is to work and WHO start and we talk with them and we start initiate and initiate discussions and more of scientific driven uh, preparedness. That's all. And like I said, we always value our work with them through all the years that we have done. And we definitely will work more about all of this. Dr. Mahmoud, regarding the recommendation coming from the report, I would refer back to you. Uh, thank you, Hazim. Uh, just I'd like to start with, uh, uh, there is, I, I think everybody knows that the test itself accuracy, sensitivity is 75%. So we cannot 100% say that uh, the Northwest Syria have no coronavirus at all. We cannot consider this. We don't know. According to the test, this is the result. All of the results are negative. But it doesn't mean, in spite of there's some patient, they repeat the test many times, but it doesn't mean that uh, Northwest Syria are totally clear from uh, coronavirus. This is to start. For recommendation issue, we, we need to start with to improve the plan, with, to change the plan to be proper for the situation in North of Syria, especially in terms of preparation for the hospital-based, the hospital-based isolation, either inward or in the ICU. In terms of PPE, up till now, there are no, no personal protection equipment, which is maybe only a little preparation. The only single hospital, maybe one hospital, which is ready uh, prepared by NGO, not by our colleague, unfortunately, we hope that this uh, PRP will move a bit rapid to be able to absorb estimated cases. So we need training, we need PPE, we need to fill at least in the minimum the gap in the health system in Syria in terms of ICU beds and ward beds. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Ola, I wondered if you could um, 
could, as an infectious disease expert, um, give us more of an explanation of how you would see coronavirus spreading in Idlib's displacement camps and among displaced people, and what the particular challenges um, for these populations are when it comes to preventing coronavirus spreading. Thank you. So I'm going to preface this uh, by saying I'm actually a consultant in infectious diseases, so I'm a clinician, uh, but of course I have some experience of uh, clinical epi. Um, so I have to say that's a very difficult question. And the reason I say that is that we have so many unknowns in many other settings, which are high income settings. Um, so even in the high income settings, we still don't know the percentage, for example, of asymptomatic people. We still don't know as much as we would like as to the uh, transmission that is pre-symptomatic uh, versus the transmission that is post-symptomatic. Um, and we still don't have enough information about the secondary attack rate. So if I had coronavirus and I went home, uh, what proportion of my family uh, or my household contacts would develop coronavirus? And of course, the vulnerabilities and susceptibilities that we have um, in many of the areas where the studies on coronavirus um, uh, uh, COVID 2019 are being made are predominantly in high income settings at the moment. There's a wealth of information from China, from Italy, um, from the U USA, from the UK, from Europe. And I share my colleagues' frustration because why would a city or a province in China bear similarities to Northwest Syria? So in terms of should there be a case in Northwest Syria, how does it spread, how many people are affected and how are they affected um, is a very difficult question to answer. Um, and something very specific is that this modeling, this, well, this forecasting and many of the other um, similar initiatives that are occurring are based on the Chinese CDC reports. And so they reported on about 44,000 patients and they estimated that 5% will be critical. Uh, that is, they need admission to intensive care and probably need a ventilator. 14% are so-called severe cases for their potentially people that would need to be admitted to a normal inpatient facility for isolation. Um, but the reality is we don't know. So we don't know if vulnerable people in northwest Syria whose nutritional status um, is extreme, extremely poor, who've been affected by violence and conflict and illness and haven't accessed healthcare, will share those same proportions. Um, it is important when we think about Northwest Syria and uh, Dr. Hazim and Dr. Munzer and Dr. Mahmoud have very nicely done three different scenarios. And the scenario that is the most concerning and perhaps the most pertinent from this report is the one relating to IDP, um, IDP camps where the 1.2 million uh, that Dr. Mahmoud mentioned are based. I'm extremely concerned about that population because the density there uh, is among the highest that we've seen anywhere in the world. Um, and the reality is, so going back to that question of, can we say for certain that there are no cases? I'm not sure that we can, because if you imagine you've only got a finite number of testing kits, you've got one laboratory in Idlib at the moment that's been able to do them, you're going to have to ration the tests, just as we did in the UK, for example, um, early on when our tests were limited. Um, and that does mean that you're going to have to pick a case definition where it's going to make a difference as to whether that patient tests positive or negative. So you wouldn't be able to test as many of the population as you would like to, and you wouldn't really be able to identify um, the reservoir in these populations of patients who may be asymptomatic, may not meet the case definition, um, and so remembering the fact that it's not just a respiratory uh, presentation that patients present with, a large proportion might present with gastrointestinal or non-specific symptoms. So the honest answer is we don't know, and I'm going to end by saying when we do start identifying cases, um, and I think all of us um, even the most optimistic will say that it's going to be very likely because of our proximity to um, Turkey, for example, and also government controlled areas where there are cases identified, is that in real time with the information you have day by day, you build on forecasting tools on models that you understand how uh, COVID-19 behaves in these populations. Thank you. Um, Dr. Mahmoud and, Ham and Hazem, I wondered if you could explain more about the different scenarios that you've laid out in your research and which one you think is actually most likely to happen. 
um, in the coming months and which, um, yeah, it, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Well, we consider three scenarios, as Hazim mentioned, with different parameters. The first one, uh, and for the whole population, all population scenario in Northwest Syria, uh, which is more than four million. And the second one was changing the parameters from medium to high in terms of attack rate, uh, which is uh, for the second scenario. In the third scenario, we consider only camp population, uh, 1 million 200,000. And this is uh, the, the three scenarios. And here we consider the, uh, the uh, clinical doubling date, sorry, it's uh, very fast, not fast. This is according to the tool. And the most important issue, why we consider only eight weeks for two reasons. The first one, this is one part of the limitation of the tool, which is not maybe an epidemic tool, but it can be useful for, uh, for advocacy, maybe for preparation tool. Uh, the second issue, uh, the, the second issue is about, uh, sorry, Hazim, can you consider, talk about the parameters right now? I'm sorry. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, from our side, as like I said, I mean, using the attack rate or the doubling rate is something that is controversial. Um, definitely the basic reproduction rate is the number that any and any model is building on. Um, from our side, like I said, we tried and uh, we used numbers. I mean, 20% is, of course, 0 0.2. So like I, I'm seeing some questions that are asking about uh, the attack rate. So it's a nearly 0 0.2 uh, estimation. Um, and uh, I mean, we saw some, I mean, we can of course provide, and this has been, if you can look at the references, it has been provided what is the logic behind that. Of course, it is debatable. I would say always all these numbers and as scientists, it's all debatable and up to change as per the discussion that's, uh, that's, uh, that can happen. Um, but this is how we thought of it as a team of experts. So a 20% of attack, like 0 0.2 attack rate seems to be quite reasonable like i said putting in mind the influenza um, attack rate ranges between three percent three percent to eleven percent and uh, that has been mentioned of course you can look at it at the cdc website um, but like i said it's all debatable people are estimating it and it's totally and it, of course a unified and universal attack rate all over population categories is incorrect but in terms that we are looking as a forecasting tool, this is what we have agreed upon and this is what we are going, I mean, we have the scientific background to push, to tell and talk about that. Um, of course, and I would always repeat, everything is up to debate, everything is about the discussion and we are open for WHO or any other entity, just come and help us and work with us in building a better model and make the response for Dr. Munzer and Dr. Mahmoud, the guys in Idlib, a better, uh, better uh, scientific-driven response. Well, uh, I remember the second issue. I'm sorry. Uh, for the second issue, we mentioned that we, we choose only eight weeks. Uh, when we look to the overwhelmed uh, critical point for the health system, we found that fair enough, that this is enough to study right now here on this date. So this is uh, why we choose eight weeks. Thank you. Um, so this one's for Dr. Munzer. What is the role of the Idlib Health Directorate in helping communities manage their health system preparations in Northwest Syria? Um, how do you work with the World Health Organization currently and other donor agencies and NGOs? Uh, actually, uh, we work uh, daily with WHO. We are part from the uh, task force. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we work with uh, donors and with NGO and with all our partners in daily uh, work. So uh, uh, we, we are part of uh, uh, all uh, activity uh, planning uh, for PRB. Uh, but the, the, what we mentioned actually many times that we we have some note about the the coordination mechanism in task force, and we uh, want. Uh, to our partner uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to be able to share their views more than what happened last time, because at the end we need uh, PRB depend on the reality on the ground and depend on scientific numbers. And this is one of the most important things uh, uh, about this study. We need uh, to put, uh, uh, when we, when we uh, uh, like, uh, uh, 
do uh, uh, need assessment, we have to depend on scientific numbers. Because if you say, for example, you in Idlib need uh, 90 ventilators, the first question uh, actually uh, uh, come to mind that uh, according to what? What's the scientific? What's the numbers? We depend uh, to say that our needs in Idlib 90 ventilators or 100 or 150. So the, the one of the most important issue for us uh, uh, about this study to put scientific numbers on the table and depend on scientific issue uh, for future. In terms of society, actually last time we uh, with uh, civil defense and other organization work inside Idlib, we publish a uh, campaign with name uh, uh, Volunteers Against Corona and we expect the number of volunteers will be about uh, roughly 10,000 persons uh, because as you know that uh, we don't have like other countries, we don't have army, we don't have police, we don't have supporting uh, institution in Idlib, so we will depend more on society to uh, protect our health facility and protect our medical staff and to help people actually to go to the uh, society distance. We started our work from uh, about uh, three weeks and actually we focus on, on, on the, the, the activity related to uh, uh, society in, in, in this term. And one of the, our most rare to actually protect the medical staff because uh, as you know now in North, in North Syria in general, we have just 600 doctors. So we have just 1.4 doctors for each 10,000 person. And I think after Corona, maybe our uh, uh, health sector collapsed according to the lack of medical staff because we, we think that maybe if uh, uh, we face a lot of problem uh, in society level, according to lack of our capacity, uh, the medical staff uh, maybe uh, 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 maybe maybe uh, ha have harm uh, uh, from the society or or according to the uh, you know military group and uh, uh, all the the problems in in this area. So one of the most uh, important target actually to protect our medical staff and protect our health facility and the best way to us to protect them through uh, society through the response of the society itself. Uh, just to add for Dr. Windsor, for the uh, health personnel gap, we are trying and working with one of our partners in order to uh, implement uh, telemedicine, tele-ICU through the, uh, the internet for the ICU patients. And we have already a, a team of volunteers around the world. They can help us in this regard. They are able to train our staff and they are able and willing to help in the ICU. But up till now, there is no ICU to receive any patient, unfortunately. Following on from that, what you've just said, Dr. Mahmoud and um, Dr. Munzer, could you give more of an overview for the audience of what the medical infrastructure is like in Northwest Syria um, and how it works together with local councils um, and NGOs and other actors to kind of operate? Because we know that it's been subjected to a systemic campaign of attack from Russia and the Syrian regime. What are the knock-on effects of that kind of recent campaign when it comes to tackling coronavirus now? Um, and how many hospitals and isolation centers are actually ready to receive corona patients? Well, uh... In terms of the PRP plan, uh, it's planned that we will have a community-based isolation. Up till now, there is a plan for 30. All are prepared by our partners, but it's not yet finished. Maybe there is one or two already uh, with 40 bits. When we are talking about CBI, it means uh, only for isolation for a patient without need for any support, for any medication, just maybe a nurse, uh, will visit this patient and uh, maybe there is a round day every day there is once a visit by a doctor uh, and this you know the, it will consider maybe 80 percent of the symptomatic patient for hospital-based isolation also some of our partners uh, prepare three hospitals which not, which is not up till now totally ready for receiving any patient there is one hospital have only four uh, ICU which is already available and just maybe rehab for this place and uh, contain uh, 20 beds. Uh, the other one is in the way to be ready. All of these are prepared and supported by our partners and this is the only preparation. If, if I can add uh, something here actually this is part of our problem. 
because uh, when we say that we in Idlib we have just 47 uh, 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 adult ventilators, if we turn some of those ventilators to receive corona patient, we will lose the services for other uh, uh, patient. And in this way, we of course will save some lives uh, uh, for corona patient, but we, what, what we will lose others' life. Problem. And actually, maybe somebody will ask me why you accept that. If uh, you think that it is not the correct way, why you accept that? Because we don't have choices, actually. We accept that because we don't have other choices. Because now if, if I have a corona patient in Idlib, I, 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 I have to, to offer to him a patient bed. I have to offer him a ventilator, an ambulance car. So we accept to return some our services and, uh, and the equipment and some of our facilities to uh, uh, receive corona patient uh, because we don't have other choices and we don't have other resources to establish a new one. So this is the part of our problem and this uh, 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 mention to this three facility in plan B, but I think the most important thing now to think how we can apply plan A, which uh, continue establish a new health facility to receive corona patient in future. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question from Sami Saloum in the audience. Um, what has been done by the World Health Organization so far? Did you share the report with them and have they responded? Uh, we are going to share the report with them and uh, maybe we'll be able to discuss it uh, in the meeting, hopefully soon, and the, the report is ready. And um, what has been done by the World Health Organization so far in Idlib? In terms of preparation, you mean? I think Dr. Minzer mentioned all of this. Uh, according to PRP, there is a plan A, which is considering uh, establishing uh, 28 CBI and three hospitals. Uh, three hospitals contain, must contain uh, 30 uh, ICU beds each and 40 uh, ward beds each. But up till now, uh, nothing of the plan A uh, has been implemented and only uh, move to plan B, which is few hospitals prepared by our partners. And they said, okay, we can dedicate this hospital and this hospital for coronavirus, which have maybe in total 25 ICU beds. Uh, it's not ready yet. Thank you. Um, so we've got time for a few more questions and then we'll wrap up for the day. Um, so, uh, a question from Birgitta Schulke. I would be interested to hear why the panelists think there haven't been any cases in Idlib so far. Is it only because they've not been detected yet or do you think that there are other reasons? Maybe we could start with uh, Dr. Aula. So I think my colleagues will have some very valuable things to say about this. Um, it's going to be a combination of factors. So remember, we don't have enough health facilities across the area uh, for anyone that um, becomes symptomatic, for example, um, to seek healthcare, um, get to the right health facility at the right time. So you can imagine in a high income setting, uh, if you're symptomatic, you might call um, a particular number or you might present yourself to the local health facility. That isn't a luxury uh, that people in Northwest Syria have to the same extent that we do. So the distances between health facilities will be great. Um, and remember that there is still shelling um, occurring in some of the areas. So people are actually afraid to go to health facilities and pretend, present to healthcare workers. Um, of course, there's under testing and we discussed that there are insufficient numbers of tests to meet the demand. Um, and it will also relate to the fact that we're probably not picking up asymptomatic cases. So at the beginning of this outbreak, we weren't sure um, if there was a reservoir among asymptomatic people. Uh, now we're beginning to understand that a different portion of the population that you might test are, who are asymptomatic um, might test positive on the PCR test that's being used. Um, what I would like is to hear from uh, Dr. Mahmoud and Dr. Minzer about this, because I'm sure they'll have more insights. Maybe the good thing is that uh, the North West Syria is almost isolated as a whole. There is no crossing points uh, either uh, from Turkish side or from 
regime side or the, the, the other forces side. So in spite of there is a little maybe crossing these borders, but uh, this is maybe for fortunate for our situation. But as I said before, we cannot sure 100 percent that is, there is no case at all in North or Syria at all. Um, I would like also to add here that we have in general like um, a robust system uh, that is the EWON system, the early, uh, the early uh, alert and response network that is really, um, they are really great guys and they have done excellent job during uh, the whole years of the conflict. Um, they were the people that have detected the first cases of polio in 2014, 2013 and then later on they keep doing this work and they have monitors all over. So um, these are our best, uh, let's say, fighters in all of this. They are uh, going on the ground, uh, collecting cases, and have, and they are the ones who are uh, working with the labs and making sure that everything is correct. So as far as I'm concerned and working and talking to them, they are doing their best that they have. The number of tests is very minimal, but in general, all other indicators, including the severe acute respiratory illnesses, has the numbers has been not that high. So we are at least a little bit um, on the safe side. Like we can say that it's a little bit, um, we are a little bit confident, but yet, it must not thwart the idea of preparedness. This is the one thing that, because lack of lack of numbers doesn't mean that it is not there from our side. We make sure that, because when we start with the first case, we will have very limited time to start preparedness for all of this. Putting in mind the history that we are seeing of these cases all over the world um, and the pandemic that is going and ravaging all over the world. Thank you so much. So for the final question for today, um, because I know we've got many members of the media here today, we've got over 160 attendees listening. Um, we've got a question from Maha Akra from Brokaw Press. My question, what can media outlets do to help the population in Idlib at this time? What can media outlets do to help the population around the world? I think this this question could be for Dr. Munzer about the media role. Yeah, I think actually uh, uh, the main issue uh, uh, media can help us in, in advocacy at least uh, because for a long time we suffering from a lot of issue. By the way, Corona crisis it is not the first crisis we face in this area, and it of course it will not be the last one. We facing for a long time from a lot of a crisis, and this is sometimes part of our problem because when we ask people now to stay home, uh, the answer, the response answer uh, uh, came for, our, for, for us last time that we died for uh, chemical attacks, we died uh, according to, to uh, uh, pirate bomb uh, and uh, because of lack of water, lack of food. So why we have to respond in different way to corona, uh, uh, corona uh, 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 virus, it is not ju just like one more reason for death in this area. So I think uh, uh, in general, we feel for some time that nobody takes care in reality uh, about the people in this area. All the uh, uh, area around the world have government and the government takes the responsibility to respond and to prepare themselves to respond to, to Corona uh, crisis, but in our area, uh, unfortunately, our government attacked our hospitals and killed our medical staff. And till now, actually, and so I, I mentioned to this point, till now they attacked the, the some area in, in South Idlib. And and if if uh, just ceasefire now happened, uh, three hundred thousand people can return from the camps to South Idlib. And actually, this will will be very helpful for us. So I think the media have a great role actually to focus more about the suffering in this area and to focus more about all the crimes have been in this area uh, from uh, all the all the, the groups not uh, the, the main actually the main uh, uh, priority regime and his allies and actually we want to mention about the all the crime in this area and actually i think it will be very very uh, uh, helpful for, for for us because really we sometimes lose our hope that nobody around the world uh, hear about our suffering or nobody uh, uh, see what we what we uh, suffering all uh, uh, every every day
So I think uh, you have a great role actually to help us. Thank you so much, Dr. Munzer. Um, we've just got one more question actually before we wrap up, um, which has just come in that there is some news about four positive tests for Syrian civilians in Afrin. Is that confirmed or not? Uh, actually, it is not confirmed till now. Uh, there were four uh, persons. Uh, uh, it's like uh, uh, they were Turkish uh, citizens, not Syrian citizens, uh, and uh, they uh, uh, moved to Turkey after uh, the uh, symptoms appear of them. So till now, we don't have confirmed cases in uh, North Syria. But that means maybe in a few days, we will receive the first cases, maybe. Okay, thank you so much to all our speakers, Dr. Munza Al-Khalil, Dr. Mahmoud Hariri, Dr. Aula Abara, and Hazem Rahawi. We're so happy to have had you with us today. Um, thank you so much for your time, and I hope it's been an interesting discussion for all of our attendees. And um, we'll follow up with the link to the report. If you have any questions or you'd like to interview any of our panelists, you can email the Syria campaign at media at the Syria and we'll make sure to get back to you quickly. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.